In front of you. So even though you're involved in the match, either in the innings or you're catching a rather crisis stage, you've got to always just have it out in front of you so that you can stand back from it and have a little smile at it occasionally and realize it is not really the most important thing in life. It's the only part of life. There's Colin Cardry, who has just played two superb strokes. You can see what we mean. That's got him on his wrist. Six runs still needed, and Colin Cardry coming out to bat with his left wrist broken. And the point being that David Allen has got the bowling. Cardry resumes, 19 not out. What tactics he can be suggesting, I just don't know. Last ball, now. It's a draw! It's a draw. England have played the game. Six runs short of victory. And chaos here at Lords. The umpires having the, the stump pinch from them. I've never seen this with Lords like this. The players being chased in. They'll be lucky if they get there without losing something, even if it's only a hat or a sweater. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for the many of you I haven't yet met, my name is Bruce Carnegie Brown, and I'm the new chair of MCC. I'm delighted to welcome both the audience here in the nursery pavilion at Lord's Cricket Ground and those watching online around the world to the MCC Cowdery Lecture 2021. Given the events of recent weeks, and the very significant challenges about the health and effective management of the game of cricket in our country, including select committee hearings in the House of Commons today. This year's lecture is very timely in bringing us together to reflect on what we have learned about the state of the game and what we need to do to make this game more inclusive and more accessible to people of all backgrounds. The Cowdery Lecture, and it's wonderful to see representatives of the Cowdery family with us again this evening, has become an important occasion in the cricketing calendar. As in previous years, this year's lecture will be followed by a panel discussion comprising of this year's speaker and including MCC President Claire Connor and England cricketer Kate Cross. The panel will be hosted by Mark Nicholas. Over the past two decades, the Cowdery Lecture has been given by many of the greatest names in cricket. However, only once before have we been joined by a lecturer from beyond the professional game, when in 2008, the most reverend Dr. Desmond Tutu delivered his memorable lecture. Those are big boots to fill. <laughs> Tonight's speaker may not have walked out in the middle as a professional cricketer, but he has stepped onto many stages during his accomplished career. He is an award-winning actor, best-selling author, writer, documentarian, comedian, broadcaster, and director. An advocate for raising awareness of mental health issues, he is the president and leading ambassador for the charity Mind. He has also spoken passionately about his love for cricket. He is a lifelong supporter from the stands and also a patron of MCC Foundation, supporting the charity in its mission to diversify and open up the game. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very great honor to welcome to the stage this evening's speaker, Stephen Fry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodness me. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Ladies and gentlemen, cricketers, non-cricketers, cricket curious, guests, friends, mortal enemies, <laughs> and assorted media scum. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for coming here this evening, and a very warm hello to all of you watching online. Now, while being asked, to deliver this lecture is a terrific honor. 
Fate has seen to it that it is an honor that comes with a venomous sting in its tail. How characteristic it is of what Thomas Hardy called life's little ironies, that I should address you at a time when we should happily be caught between the celebration of a mesmerizing men's T20 World Cup and the mouth-watering promise of the 72nd Men's Ashes Battle in Australia. But instead, I find myself having to give this talk from inside the choking miasma of one of those unsavory and shameful scandals that regularly seems to engulf the game we love. The mephitic stink that arose from Yorkshire two weeks ago is being smelled around the world and has done no favors to that club nor to the reputation of cricket or of this country. In the midst of this stench, do we now need another aging white male from the heart of the establishment <laughs> to lecture us in plummy tones on the spirit of cricket? I very seriously considered, despite the honor and the already printed invitations, I seriously considered recusing myself from this gig and dashing this poisoned chalice from my lips. However, I may not be a cricketer, but I know that an incoming batter does not turn tail and creep back to the pavilion because the ball is swinging. And a bowler doesn't throw the ball back to the captain because the pitch isn't to their liking. So for good or ill, here I stand. And the good news, as far as I'm concerned at least, is that I haven't had to rip up the pages of my original lecture and hastily concoct something to speak to this current crisis. I really always was going to address the story of change and more directly the issue of cricket and race too. And we will come on to the heart of that soon enough. But first of all, we have to confront another reason why I am uniquely unqualified to deliver this lecture. Even if we overlook the awkward truth that I come from exactly the cultural social pool whose embarrassing legacy cricket, especially cricket in this country, most needs to shake off. I am, as stated also, a non-cricketer. As non as there can be. <laughs> so non. Nonna than an Italian grandmother. And, <laughs> sorry. and yet here I am presuming to discourse on the spirit of the game. Who invites a eunuch to teach the harem how to hump. <laughs> well, in some regards, the old phrase is true. The spectator can see more of the game. And perhaps my experiences and observations may be of use. So first, a little history. I grew up a decidedly unathletic child. Lanky, gawky, uncoordinated to the point of dyspraxia. You know the boy, the one who when trying to catch a ball, claps his hands at it, who can't run in a straight line without colliding with trees and goalposts, who trips over the football field's white lines. Every morning of my school days was spent in trying to give myself asthma attacks so as to win what I believed to be my young, my young life's highest prize, a chit to declare me officially off games. Whatever I might have thought of cricket, which we'll come to in a moment, I loathed all other sport with a passion I could barely express. It boiled inside me. I hated the mud, the noise, the cheering and jeering, the changing rooms, the jock straps and jocularity, the showers, the reek of TCP and germaline, <laughs> the virility, the towel flicking and todger flaunting. <laughs> I quivered inside with fear, inadequacy, and shame. I was different in so many ways, and sporty toughs loved more than anything to pick on, torment, and suppress the different. But my wretched anguish fermented rage, too. Life was a battle for me. No, not a battle, a war, a total war between the aesthetic and the athletic, between sport and thought, brain and brawn, the philosopher and the philistine, the bohemian and the barbarian, and never, never, never the twain could meet. I learned how to mock, 
my technique against bullying was exemplary. If someone couldn't take the lash of my tongue and leapt forward to attack me physically, I would throw up my hands and cry, no, 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 don't hit me. It'll give me an erection. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's a gratifyingly successful ploy, which I <laughs> recommend to anyone who hides in fear of bullies. I'm sorry. Anyway, to return to our theme, cricket. Cricket had always been exempt from my hatred and my scorn because, well, bizarre as it sounds, it all began with P.G. Woodhouse um, and his Mike and Smith stories, Smith with a silent P. Mike Jackson, the co-hero of these, is a cricketer, the finest batsman of his generation. And the way Woodhouse presented the game and its extraordinary subtleties, the thrilling suspense of his descriptions of climactic matches, still the best cricket writing in fiction that I know, captivated me completely. I suddenly saw something intensely fascinating and beautiful in the drama of the game, the rainbow of possible outcomes, the prowess in mind reading, bluffing and guessing, the exquisite balance of it all, the luck the timing, the weather, the interdependence of so many factors. It seemed to me that in just the way that a novel or film tested the hero, so a cricket match tested the player. I know how pretentious reading aesthetics or deep meaning into athletic competition can sound, but I'm too old to care now. <laughs> At any rate, I decided that cricket would be exempt from my passionate loathing of sport. And I began to fall on cricket writing like a, like a lion falling on an antelope. Everything by Neville Cardus and the great C.L.R. James, Jack Fingleton's Brightly Fades the Dawn and Masters of Cricket, and my all too distant kinsman C.B. Fry's Life Worth Living. And that's how I came to start watching the game. And game it was to me, not that hated thing, sport. I yearned to be a bowler, I don't know why. Wasn't it Fred Truman who, once puffing his way back to long on after a fruitless spell in which he'd given his all, expostulated, last fucking bowler to be knighted was Sir Francis fucking Drake. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> as, a, as a boy, I would practice bowling all summer long using a child's swing in the garden as a wicket and apples for balls. If I made the swing swing, I reckon I'd hit the top of the stumps. I attempted to emulate the style of my hero, Gloucestershire's Mike Proctor. In aping his chest-on style, I bowled off the wrong foot. It sounds like a euphemism for something else, doesn't it? <laughs> they say he bowls off the wrong foot. You know what I mean? Yes. He enters stage left. He, let me put it this way. He pulls from the Cambridge end of the punt. And indeed, I had known from an early age that in every sense, I bowled off the wrong foot. <laughs> manly cricket and the manly world of manly men didn't accept people like me, except perhaps as the licensed clown in the corner. When I suggest that I'd known from an early age that I was gay, I like to say that it was the moment I was born. That I slid out and looked back up and thought, that's the last time I'm going up one of those. <laughs> but, <laughs> but extraordinarily, and far from my doom-laden expectations, it turned out that I was not condemned by social convention to the furtive life of criminality, secrecy, exclusion, contempt, and shame that had been the fate of generations before me. I found that painfully glacial and incremental as it was, things changed. Yes, in the teeth of virulent opposition from many, certainly, but within my lifetime, the law, and more importantly, the generality of my fellow citizens have moved in the direction of acceptance, understanding, and equity, from police sirens to wedding bells. And here I am, six years and 10 months married. Things change. But there's always a choice as to how they change. 
They can degenerate. All they need is time and neglect. But they can regenerate too. All they need is time and will. In the 50 years that I have followed the game, have I ever seen it change? The balance of bat and ball, essential for cricket to make any sense as a sporting spectacle, became threatened in the 1960s, all agreed, by the covering of wickets, which would surely favour the bat and spoil everything. Next, that necessary equipoise was threatened the other way, by the arrival of extreme pace and the pitiless bouncer. The one-day game appeared, shyly at first, heads were shaken. Only 60 overs and innings, it'll kill the game. <laughs> the look and style of cricketers was apparently forever compromised by helmets, visors, and elastic waisted trouserings, hideous to behold. <laughs> Cane and canvas pads were replaced by wipe clean nylon fastened by Velcro. The continuing rise and mutation of one-day cricket caused panic from Windermere to Woking as white balls and black sight screens threatened the sanity of telegraph readers everywhere. <laughs> the, the ugliness of the Basil Dolivera affair and rogue South African tours caused alarm and frenzy, streaking and pitch invasions marked an end of the days when schoolboys could lie on their tummies on the boundary rope, filling in a green scoring book until they got bored, which they eventually and inevitably did, all except the specky, swatty ones who were laughed at and are now running the world. <laughs> the rest of us were too busy asking the announcer in the PA tent to put out a call for our lost friends, Hugh Janus and Ivor Harden. <laughs> long before Bart Simpson ever had the idea. <laughs> and one turbulent decade began with Jon Snow getting barracked and bombarded with tinnies and ended with batsmen getting bounced and sledged until they shriveled. Cameras and microphones got closer and closer to the action to overhear the insults and demystify the bowling actions. The art of spin had gone forever, some believed. Kerry Packer arrived and sowed his own blend of discord. Ball tampering became a matter of dinner party chat from Canterbury to Keswick. Clever 3D images were painted on the outfield, promoting power generation and insurance companies no one had ever heard of. <laughs> Advertising was not only to be seen on the grass, but on the clothes. Vodafone and Castlemaine were stitched bigger and brighter on the shirts than the three lions and the wallabies and that mysterious silver feather or fern that Kiwis seem so unaccountably fond of. <laughs> the county game was rent asunder into leagues and divisions that no one ever understood. Day-night games, coloured pyjamas, pink balls and flashing LED bales Colonel and Mrs. Buckinghamshire bridled and bristled. Is this cricket or some kind of gay disco? <laughs> to the dictionary of acronyms, initials, and subriquets were added ODI, T20, IPL, Big Bash, and The Hundred. Power plays and baseball-style pinch hitters were swept in. Hotspots and Hawkeye, referrals and replays. Umpires found themselves more and more pressured and exposed. The politics and structure of the game, with its contracts and coaches, its bloated fixture lists and auctions of broadcasting rights, caused hand-wringing, though some would prefer that it were neck-wringing. South Africa returned to the fold. Kenya. Zimbabwe, Bangladesh, Namibia, and glory be Afghanistan joined the first rank of cricket playing nations. Governance of the game was taken away from the MCC quartered here. The years of white Anglo-centric control of cricket seemed to be over, seemed. Meanwhile, drugs, drinking binges, nightclub fights, lurid and disloyal text messages and other embarrassments continued to erupt like acne on a teenager. The game became mired in scandal, intrigue and misery as the new disease of spread betting 
lived up to its name and spread, spread like cholera through a slum. Allegations of systematic cheating and spot-fixing grew commonplace, and always the cancer of racism failing to respond to each new round of treatment. Change hurts. The Daily Telegraph's great cricket writer, E.W. Jim Swanton, once burst out of the committee room here, exclaiming in a hoarse and outraged whisper, there's a woman in there. <laughs> well, well, yes, Jim, of course there is, it was explained to him. It, it's the Saturday of the Ashes Test. It's, it's the Queen. <laughs> well, so, Jim uh, absorbed this for a while and then came back with, nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> what would the old boy have thought of uh, the rise of the women's game and the idea of a, a female MCC president? Would he have been able to hold his pen and write without a vein popping? Phrases like natural variation, spin vision, the slog sweep and paddle scoop. How in hell, he might have wondered, did Warwickshire become Birmingham Phoenix and <laughs> Lancashire Manchester Originals? As for pop music blaring from the speakers, flames shooting up when boundaries are struck, fireworks, beer snakes, radio mics on fielders, it is surely the end of days. Now, it would be grossly unfair of me and wrong to use Jim Swanton as, a, as an Aunt Sally, a coconut to shy at, depicting him as a stereotypical old buffer standing in the way of change and progress. He was a remarkable man, actually. Three years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, slaving on the Burma Siam Railway. This is not someone mockingly to disparage. He came from the time he came from. We come from the time we come from. Yes, he regretted the passing of the so-called gentleman amateur and the rise of commercialism in the form of Packer and Sky. As a baby in a pram, he was present when W.G. Grace scored a century for London County, and he died just a week or so into the new millennium. I will soon be as old as he was when I first met him, as will you, if you aren't already. If Jim has watched cricket over the last 21 years since his death from the bar of heaven, I don't think he will have tut tutted. He loved the game with a profound passion and knowledge. And under it all, I had the privilege of sitting by his side for several full days of play. Under the odd huff and the even odder puff, he knew the game is not, and never has been, a frozen entity. Cricket is not a noun. It is a verb. It is, to quote T. Hume, writing on another subject, admittedly, a concrete flux of interpenetrating intensities. Whoever had the idea back in the late 18th century that catching the ball in a top hat to dismiss a batsman might be replaced by catching the ball in your hands instead. He was surely denounced in his day as a wild radical. And what anarchistic troublemaker first straightened out the hockey stick curve of early bats? And which progressive firebrand thought of removing the popping hole and replacing it with a creased trench? and then even substituting the creased trench with a plain white line. Blasphemy, abomination. Ditto Christina Wills, the woman who invented modern bowling. History tells that her brother John, an England player, nagged her to bowl at him <coughs> for practice, but the wide hoops of her skirt prevented the underarm deliveries that were the norm, so she improvised and came up with round arm and overarm. Impressed, brother John tried it himself in a match, but galloped off in a huff after being consistently no-balled. Yet eventually, that mode of delivery was accepted, which, as we know, utterly destroyed the game. <laughs> the, the ghost of Jim Swanton would see that amazingly none of these changes and later evolutions, professionalism, the covered wickets, helmets, day-night games, confirmed the dire prognostications of those who believed each one might hammer a stump into cricket's fragile heart. <coughs> the same period of my cricket-watching life saw some of the greatest matches in the game's history.
a new aggression and bold inventiveness in stroke play that no one could disapprove of. And miraculously, to keep the game balanced, far from being dead, spin bowling is supremely alive, even providing new manifestations in the form of the doostra, knuckleball, and carom ball. Reverse swing arrived. Not only does he bowl off the wrong foot, they say he swings it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Levels of fitness and standards of fielding have rocketed. And most importantly of all, this is now a game equally for men and women. Schoolgirls are matching and often exceeding schoolboys in their skill, commitment and ambition. Triumphant tests, tours and T20 tournaments in the women's game have frequently trumped and topped the men's for quality and suspense. All those mournful predictions of the death of cricket have come to nothing. But great as all this is, that still only describes the structural outward nature and appearance of cricket, its laws, its evolution of formatting, franchising, and financing. Inside, for the players, for administrators, and for us followers, plenty of questions arise, many of them grim and distressing. The length of a cricket pitch is based on the old English land measurement, the 22-yard chain, and a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. One way of looking at cricket is to call it just a game, a kind of island, ball versus bat. The spirit of cricket means fair play, applauding the opponent with a smile on your face, being a good loser. End of story. Cricket spirit has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with the rainbow of social, cultural, racial, sexual, personal elements that colour our world. Indeed, it's an escape from all those. Or you could search deeper. For example, unlike baseball and other American sports, <coughs> at the heart of cricket, there is an international element. In the US, the domestic is everything, hence our tediously obvious and rude mockery of the phrase World Series. The domestic game over here is important too, but for many, cricket comes into its own internationally. To have the visiting fans assemble here at Lord's, to sit alongside West Indian steel drums at the Oval, or Indian tabla players at Edgbaston, or amidst the Barmy Army in Eden Gardens, or the Gabba. For cricketers and fans, overseas tours are often the beginning of a lifelong love affair with the culture, food, comedy, music, and people of the nations visited. The friendships forged in the fierce fires of foreign fixtures can be imperishable, which makes the revelations to have emerged from Yorkshire and the rest of the country all the more terrible, all the less defensible, entirely less forgivable. We must remind ourselves how did cricket get to the West Indies in the first place? Why do we find it in Kenya, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan, in Uganda, Pakistan, South Africa, and India? It is a game on which the sun never sets, like the empire of administrators, soldiers, and privateers who brought it to those countries along with trains, taxes, slavery, laws, segregation, guns, governors, and garrisons. Oh, must we go there, some still ask. We all know that the footprint of cricket around the world is a colonial one, they groan. But come on, Stephen, we're no longer in control of those countries. For all that our monarch may still be depicted on a few currency notes, I haven't come here to be lectured at, well, yes, I have, but not that <laughs> kind of lecture. Are you going to go all woke on us? Well, you can call it wokeness if you think that wins an argument or proves a point. But let's stop and think for a moment. I am old enough to have attended, had I wished, the last Gentleman v. Players match in 1962, round about the time George Martin and the Beatles first recorded in Abbey Road, just over there. Public school in Oxbridge, Mr. M.J.K. Smith, Warwickshire in England, captained a gentleman's team defeated by a professional side that included Truman F.S., Edridge J.H., and Barrington K.F. That's how they were listed. Mike Smith, the gentleman amateur, 
was Mr. The non-gentleman players on the same card were surname only. That year, the fixture and the distinction was abolished. Was that wokeness? The word didn't exist back then, but there were many, many, many who flooded the newspaper letters columns with outraged objections and sorrowful lamentations about the passing of a great era and the ushering in of modern ideas and progressive liberal nonsense, phrases that preceded woke but meant the same. Was it sanctimonious virtue signaling that pressured the cricketing world to bar apartheid South Africa from playing in the teeth of dogged opposition from many running the game here? Was it wokeness that finally ushered in the age of women's cricket? Or was it not rather a frozen deferential blindness and ignorance and a disastrously complacent lack of imagination that had allowed such snobbery, inequity, and injustice to persist for so very long unchallenged? The main emotion that overcomes one when contemplating such grotesqueries as the gentleman v. players match is not so much outrage as the English signature emotion, the one we do best and have most call to feel. Embarrassment and maybe shame. Yes, shame. Well, as I say, one can choose to sling the word woke around, and indeed one can choose to sling around its opposites, words like bigoted and so on. But perhaps we can all stop second-guessing the moral makeup and motives of others, imputing this and inferring that and instead attempt to look at things steadily and whole without clannish adherence, prejudice or bias. Not an easy thing to do in any field of thought, of course, but surely worth trying. There may be those who think we should go back to gentlemen amateurs traveling on different classes from the pros when they go on overseas tours, back to apartheid, back to men-only cricket and men-only commentators and administrators. There may be. But while they were a large vocal minority, and even perhaps a majority decades ago, surely today all save the most demented and malign are now converted. One thing we can be very certain of is that in the decades to come, a very great deal of what we do and say here today will look as archaic and embarrassing as what used to be done and said here yesterday. Cricket, as I said, is a verb, not a noun, a concrete flux, you will recall, of interpenetrating intensities. One of the intensities that has always interpenetrated cricket is that of race. Now, while it would be grotesquely slimy for me to apologize for the circumstances of my birth, ethnicity, and education, it is just as slimy and grotesque not to recognize how relatively easy it has been for people like me to acquire and afford membership of this club, the MCC, to travel and watch cricket, to sit here in boxes meeting players past and present, to have our love of cricket enriched by so much access and ease. And that's just talentless non-players like me. Transfer that ease of access across to being supported in junior cricket through to the professional level like coins whose impress has been rubbed away by overuse, so the currency of those P words, privilege and patriarchy, has been all but debased. But it is surely true that the gap between what people like me desire and what we can have is so much narrower than it is for most. And if we don't see that, we're willfully looking away. Think of cricket as a house. The water that comes in from the mains may be pure and good, but what use is that if all the plumbing and pipework are still made of lead? The good old mansion may have fresh paints of coat applied every now and then. It may have ultra-fast broadband and all mod cons in the kitchen, but if the lagging in the cavity walls is asbestos. And that is what is meant by phrases like structural or institutional racism. The old toxins in the system are so insidious that many haven't noticed them or have even refused to accept that they are there. I never really saw it. I suspect most of us here never really did until it was shown to us. 
but the poisons will continue to do their deadly work unless we have the courage to make deep structural changes that do more than prettify the exterior. Films like Fire in Babylon and the astounding eloquence and passionate advocacy from Michael Holding and Ebony Rainford Brent, for example, and most recently, obviously, the courage, conviction, and clarity of Azim Rafiq must be harnessed to make a difference. I know from my own experience in fields like gay rights and mental health advocacy that advance always comes, as I've said, at a maddeningly slow pace, but meaningful structural change can happen. That I know too. Taking the knee is one outward and visible sign of an inward faith. It's not a solution, but rather a message, a prayer, perhaps, a commitment to something more than sighing and shrugging the shoulders or parroting the fatuous and wicked lie that politics has nothing to do with sport. Where a national anthem is an expression of loyalty and belonging, so taking the knee is an expression of a wider loyalty and belonging. But the commitment is not the deed. We have scotched the snake, not killed it. There are plenty of boils on the body of cricket. And when, as in the Yorkshire case, they erupt and burst their noxious matter over the front pages, it behoves us all to make a huge effort to understand what is going on, what it means, and how it can be addressed. It astounds me that there can still be administrators, governors, and board members in professional cricket who have not understood the history and the pain and prefer dogged denial to open scrutiny. Cleansing the Orgean stables of Headingley has been a horribly necessary experience, but it will count for nothing if we all fail to own it, learn from it, and act upon it. There's been of late a whole new recalibration in human affairs, as among many other hard truths, we come to grips here in the West with the legacy of empire and subjugation which gave the world cricket, but also raped the riches and resources of peoples around the world, stole the dignity and rights of more than a billion, and created an imbalance that for so long has seemed permanent, immutable, and unquestionable. But questioning the unquestionable is the very thing that drives our species forward, and it propels and energizes the game of cricket, too. After all, who could question the gentleman amateur or the prerogative of the MCC to govern cricket? For 200 years, who could question the unique rights of just one sex to invade the male sanctuary of lords itself, unless cleaning and serving, or at a push, visiting as a reigning monarch? All our lives we have seen and heard old men grumbling about change, disparaging new ideas, sneering at the ideals, hopes and beliefs of the young. In the wider world, no less than in cricket, of course. I pray I'll never, never succumb to the easy, rancid, better in my day, young people nowadays rubbish. I may believe the fashions, films, and music were better in my day, but the generations above me swore that too. Always have, always will, from the dawn of time to the crack of doom. When embittered and rancorous old men today say it was better back then, what they really mean, it was better for them. The young can see this with absolute clarity. My generation, gender and ethnicity had the pick of the careers, clubs, jobs, medals, rewards, access and status. The student grants and easy mortgages, the fat of the land. For the privately educated, the rewards were even richer. In cricket, our schools had facilities that state schools could only dream of. There were professionals employed to teach all the skills and even give many of their pupils chances to go abroad on tours of the West Indies, South Asia, and Australasia. Even today, there are more privately educated professional cricketers than probability alone would determine. I'm proud and pleased to be, uh, as Brian said, a patron of the MCC Foundation, which, among many other aims, seeks to arrange ways for those private schools to open their facilities to all the girls and boys in their area. But it's all typically Britishly slow progress, and there are still plenty of old, and indeed not so old, farts, whose veins start out on their foreheads at the sound of words like inclusion and diversity, 
finding it easier to dismiss them as woke jargon or anything that might excuse them from helping enrich the game they profess to love. How hard it is to get into cricket is one thing. Nature must bless you with extraordinary hand-eye coordination, balance and speed. You need the opportunity to play and learn from a young age, which demands facilities, time and access. You must overcome racial and class barriers that can put off all but the most brave and persistent. But even once you become a player, it's far from a straight and happy path from debut to testimonial year and benefit dinner. Over the years, and certainly in my lifetime, players have been treated abysmally by the rulers of the game. The cricketing lords, they were called, partly because they governed from this place, Thomas Lord's cricket ground, but also because so many of them were lords. Post-war may have been slightly less aristocratic than Lord Hawke and his fellow blue bloods, but for decades they were Oxbridge and public school almost to a man and treated players with paternalistic condescension. Great players, now legends, summoned to the committee room by pompous prefect types like school fags brought up for a beating. Those of us who experience such degrading humiliations as children know that the school experience exemplifies the real self-sustaining wickedness of this kind of power structure. So often the ones who suffered as juniors would grow up to visit new punishments and abuses on the next generation. I had it tough, so should you. Cricket long suffered from the vicious cycle of bullying dressing rooms, hard men humbling the softer, more sensitive players, and an atmosphere of unforgiving cruelty that was called manliness. I cannot imagine that anyone would want to go back to the time when new players were hazed and the England captain was expected to be either a pit bull enforcer or a kind of shiny, well-scrubbed head boy with a straight parting and a goody-goody role as ambassador, the safe pair of hands who showed prospective new parents around and read the lesson on Founders Day. Sometimes there isn't enough vomit in the world, is there? <laughs> but... Consider fitness. I think we would all agree that just about every specialist batter of today is physically fitter, swifter and stronger than even the quickest pace bowler of 20 years ago. Sports science, cutting edge nutrition, biometrics and the demands of the modern game require and achieve levels of fitness unheard of in the past. The fielding, the running between the wickets, the stamina, they've all attained levels of athleticism that have demonstrably driven the game forward in all kinds of thrilling ways. But advocates and apologists for the game of cricket, like us, have always claimed that cricket's special glory lies in its combination of the physical and the mental. One side of the mental can be expressed as cognitive smarts, the reading of the game, the outwitting of the opposition. But what is the point of being supremely fit and fast if you've a broken ankle? And what is the point of being the cleverest cricketer in the world if you're broken inside? I have a dog in this fight. I speak as one who has had his own struggles with mental health over the years and have for the last 12 years or so, as Brian also said, been the president of MIND, our country's largest mental health charity and advocacy group. At its darkest, cricket has left behind a tragic trail of misery, addiction, despair and suicide. We all know examples of the lost. In times of war, they would have been called fallen comrades and been mourned and commemorated on walls and plaques. To honour those whom cricket cruelly emptied and threw away, this needs to change, and is changing. Thanks to the courage and candour of leading players like Jonathan Trott, Sarah Taylor, Marcus Triscothic, this is a subject at last being understood and addressed. Freddie Flintoff, Ben Stokes, many others represent scores of the less internationally celebrated figures than them who have had the courage and sense to value their mental fitness as highly as their physical. At the summit of the game, as we all see in the televised tournaments that stream to us from around the world, cricket is flourishing. Those at the top are enjoying newfound rewards, fame, success and fulfilment. Thanks to the big bash, 
the IPL and other franchises, they are bonding with players from varying nations, religions, cultures and ethnicities like never before, finding respect, understanding and friendship. And for themselves, their mental health can be addressed without embarrassment or stigma. Wonderful as this is, important as their example can be, the spirit of cricket can't only be expected to trickle down from the top. I speak to you from inside the most famous nursery in cricket. But every school, every village, every town team, every league, every county is a nursery too. On several occasions this morning when speaking to the DCMS Parliamentary Special Committee this morning, uh, Azim Rafiq mentioned the game's grassroots. Cricket is played on grass. The international stars may be the top dressing for the pitch. But the true spirit of cricket is fed, sown and nourished below the surface at the grass roots. This is one reason why these recent revelations are existentially crucial for cricket to understand and deal with. The thought that so many potential players are put off the game because they are being made to feel unwelcome, because their cries of pain at this exclusion are not heard, all this creates a bare, sparse, hostile and ultimately unplayable surface. Like my homeland, my befuddled, bewildered, benighted and bedeviled homeland itself, cricket is beautiful and brutal, fair and foul glorious and ghastly, decent and degraded. And also, as with my homeland, my love and belief in cricket and its ability to change are strong enough and deep enough for me to believe that all is not yet lost. But not until those lead pipes and that asbestos lagging are torn out can the house of cricket stand proud. Cricket and the wider culture owe Azim Rafiq an enormous debt as well as an enormous apology. When he said today that he didn't want his son to go anywhere near cricket, my heart fell to my boots. But actually, that simple statement crystallizes everything. It gives us a clear human image that says it all. It's a rallying cry. Unless all our nation's sons and daughters with the talent and desire to have a life in cricket are confident that cricket will want to have a life with them. The spirit of cricket, its very flame, will flicker and go out. Let's dedicate ourselves to ensuring that that will never happen. Thank you so very much.
Stephen. Um, this began with Richie Benno and crystal clear minimalism. Um, it went through Imran Khan and Great Authority, Brian Lara and Huge Flair, the New Zealanders Martin Crowe and Brendan McCullum with their innovative thinking, Kuma Sangakara's extraordinary language and phrasing, and Bishop Desmond Tutu, whose magic lit up the indoor school. But tonight you bought us language as art, and you applied it to cricket, and you sent us messages through your remarkable mind and from a perspective that seems to know no boundary. You truly lit up this room. Thank you so much. We will hear again from Stephen in a moment. Um, I think, I, I hope you will all agree with my next move that is not pre-planned and neither the chairman nor the chief executive nor Lauren know anything about it. But it suddenly occurred to me that in the last few months we've lost three very special people. Um, outstanding members of MCC, outstanding cricket people and amongst the greats of their field. Most recently, we said goodbye to a recent chief executive of this club, Keith Bradshaw, whose role here was enlightened and fascinating and always interested and always fair and kind, and who then moved to South Australia to build, some might say, an even better stadium than the cricket ground they had before, but certainly create some of the magic there that he'd brought us here. To lose Keith was a bitter blow to those of us that knew him well. We lost Johnny Woodcock, one of the greatest writers and cricket people there have ever been, primarily because he understood the game and gave it a perspective that few others could. He was calm and, again, fair and kind, which seems to be an ongoingly valuable message for us and for cricket. Johnny was involved with Colin in the early writing of the spirit of cricket and certainly in the literature of the preamble. And Johnny guided Colin in, in, in the phrasing, in the planning of the message. Alongside them both was the incomparable Ted Dexter, whose cricket enthralled us, whose personality constantly amazed us, and whose role in taking over from Colin to push the spirit of cricket further and further onwards and onwards was very committed and very real. Ted was a great player a great entertainer, an adventurer, and to see him gone too is a dreadful thing. So those three men are very important to us all. And rather than have a moment's silence, I thought we might just erupt into applause for Keith Bradshaw, Johnny Woodcock, and Ted Dexter. Um, right, now, uh, Kate Cross, really good cricketer, that's the first thing, got into the Ashes side in 2014, played over uh, in the test match at the Wacker in Western Australia, took six in the match for 70 from 35 overs. England won the match and went on to win the Ashes. I think two separate spells in each innings in those 35 overs of three for 35, a lot of threes and 35s and things going on in that. Um, she's an outstanding one-day cricketer, bowls at a lively pace, moves the ball, which seems to me to be an important asset, um, has been an outstanding short-form player, an outstanding leader, recently led the Manchester Originals in, in the 100, um, and has played all over the world, both in, in Perth and Brisbane in Australia, uh, in the Big Bash there, and here uh, with Lancashire and, and as I say, um, Manchester and, uh, and for England. So. Um, that's one thing. But another thing is her broadcasting. We worked together on the recent England tour of India when she did some stuff with TalkSport. And she's really good. She has a fabulous podcast with Alex Hartley. And now we've heard from Stephen. I know there's no holes barred. That podcast is called No Balls, which is no ballsy brave in itself, isn't it? 
and please welcome Kate Cross. Uh, please welcome back to the stage Stephen Fry. So 234 years on, the club nailed it. A former England captain, a left arm spinner and batsman, a teacher in her earlier days, head of women's cricket, then managing director of women's cricket. England winning the World Cup here on this ground, on one of the great days in front of a full house. A day only matched at this ground by England winning the Men's World Cup. Two achievements of such staggering enormity that the people who were behind them deserves large rounds of applause, as Geoffrey Archer might say. Um, she is now the first Lady President of MCC. Please welcome Claire Connor. There's, there's water behind you, but um, Stephen, I have to tell you that, that we're sitting down there and we looked at each other, the three of us, and said, oh, crikey, we've got to follow that. Um, so here we are looking to follow that. Claire, I must start with you. Um, a phone call, I imagine, from Kumar Sangakkara that asked you a question. Yes, uh, a very memorable phone call, one of the most memorable. Um, a month before lockdown, um, and Kumar rang me from Pakistan. Uh, where he was leading uh, an MCC cricket tour um, to ask me to, to follow him in this uh, uh, hugely privileged position. Um, I didn't have to think about it for very long. Um, and obviously I was due to start last year, uh, but COVID put paid to that because uh, Kumar would have lost his year. So um, I'm five weeks in, I think. 85 courses, it feels like, lots of, uh, lots of meals, lots of lovely conversations um, and thoroughly enjoying it. It's the, it's the most amazing honor. I was thinking when Stephen started, when he talked about the timing of being asked to, of him being asked to, to deliver this lecture, the timing for me to step into this role as president of this club, I don't think could be more perfect. Um, with where the women's game is, with where women's sport is, uh, with the MCC's very progressive agenda um, around those uh, important words of inclusion and diversity. Um, it's, uh, I think I'm in for a real treat of a year and I'm loving it so far. Great. Um, Kate, it's a wonderful time to be a female cricketer, isn't it? I mean, after the, the 100, which is one thing, the, 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 the coverage, the crowds here, um, for a number of the games, there would be 12 or 13,000 people in the ground for the first match of the day that the women were playing. Um, the interest in women's cricket, the amount of girls attracted to the game now from all ages, age 7 or 8, up to 14 or 15, finally it's really happening. Yeah, it is. And first and foremost, I think it's always a privilege to be a female cricketer. Um, I think I've had a journey in sport in cricket that has been um, very similar for a lot of girls my age. Um, I had a lot of male influence in my career. So I had an uncle, a dad, a brother who got me into the game. Um, and hopefully we're getting to a stage where now we can have aunties, mums, grandmas maybe, sisters who get them into the game as well. So um, yeah, I think the 100 was a, a probably a perfect example of all that accumulating and getting to a stage where we want cricket to be for females. We want people to come and watch us play. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very privileged place to be at the moment. At, at national level, we do want to catch up the Aussies. Um, it was a st staggering thing that they should win that World T20 because everybody had tuned in, I'm sure, and seen them play England. And, and Joss Butler and co gave them a bad beating and you didn't really see Australia as winners of that tournament, but they found a way. Having played uh, um, for Perth Scorchers and Brisbane Heat, is, is cricket in Australia tougher? I wouldn't say tougher. I would just say they're probably five years ahead of us in terms of the professionalization of the game, which I think we've seen in this country going into our eighth year of professionalism now. I think we turned professional in 2014. Um, it gives girls the opportunity to take cricket seriously, you know, to not worry about university and studies. 
and completely focus on the game, which boys and men get the opportunity to do from a very young age. So now that we've shifted the focus of career paths for girls, um, I think that's just something that Australia have done a little bit sooner than us. They turned professional probably two or three years before us and the domestic structures underneath their international level um, is also professional as well. Uh, Claire, c can you pick up on that? Is, it, it, is that something that needs more money? Uh, more people helping, more backroom staff? How, how do you make that happen? Oh, I think money is always an important um, aspect. Uh, investment across the game um, is, is important. I think the, the, the Kate's right, the, the big step that we've taken now a couple of years ago is, the, is to in invest in our domestic female players. Um, and, you know, we've got 50 female domestic players now on contracts, professional contracts, um, plus the opportunity and the platform and the visibility that the 100 gives the women's game. I think we're going to see that kind of inspiration effect with more girls picking up bats and balls than we've ever had before. Um, but it's also, it, it, money's one thing, visibility's one, uh, really important, you know, that, that adage of you can't be what you can't see. And the 100 and the Women's World Cup final and lots of things over the last few years have really driven that visibility. But it is also about culture change. It's about everybody in the game, whether they're a volunteer at a club or on a club committee or working in the professional game or anybody with any kind of involvement or influence in the game giving you know women and girl women's and girls cricket and women and girls the same opportunities and the same backing and the same facilities um, the same access to good coaching and everything that you know Stevens mentioned about pathways and all of that um, it's only really you know we're a young sport when it comes to that um, and I think we're transforming quickly we're investing significantly in my day job at ECB um, and we still have a long way to go to, to, to close lots of the gaps and some of the sort of in, in inequities in the game. Um, but I think we're, we're on a really good path and we're making good progress, yeah. Let's turn to a bit of romance because um, you talked about P.G. Woodhouse and being unsporty. But of course, Sir Oliver Popplewell, who I'm thrilled to see is here tonight, a former president uh, of the club and one of the great men of cricket, and his eldest son is Nigel Popplewell, who is an exact contemporary of ours. Yeah. And did you not play with him in, in the garden in Buckinghamshire? <laughs> I tried. I, I went. I watched. I used to look at Nigel. And I would see that he had a head and shoulders and hands and legs, just like me, but he could catch a ball and hold it in, under his control, as Law 33.3 demands. And he could strike a ball with a bat, and he could bowl. And I couldn't understand why I had not been blessed with any of this. He went on to play first for Hampshire, as, as you know, with you, and then, then to Somerset in that great team, uh, the, the J JPS winning team that included Joel Garner, Vivian Richards, Ian Botham, and so many. And, and, and I. I, I owe so much to the to the Popperwells for my love of cricket, but also, in fact, it was Margaret Popperwell uh, who gave me the, my first P.G. Woodhouse book, which is how I came to love cricket even more. And uh, I, I, re I remember the, the, the Popperwells used to host some of the touring players That's from right. Australia and other places who didn't want to stay at you know, the Russell Square Hotel or wherever they used to stay, would, would be invited by the Popwells to stay with them. And I remember once coming to a dinner when I was really pretty young, and Ashley Mallett, who died this year a few months ago, spin bowler, and Ross Edwards were the guests. And they had a fascinating conversation, which has always stuck with me, because the very heart of sport. Ashley Mallett said he thought he was going to leave cricket, and Ross Edwards was very surprised. He, he was to make 99 the next day at Lord's Poor Soul. Um, uh, and said, why, mate, why? And Ashley Mallett said, because I just losing just tears me apart. I can't take it, and I get so terrified of losing. And Ross said, yeah, but winning is bigger. And he said, no, it isn't. And I thought, that's really interesting. There are two types of people in all sport and maybe in all life. Those for whom losing is so punishing that they almost can't play because the cost is too high. And those for whom winning is all, and it, 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 you know, one win just makes everything good. And I've th I think about those two a lot. It's a fascinating thing, isn't it? Mm. Um, who was your first, uh, I don't know, hero? I, uh, wh who inspired you first? Just cricket? Yes. Andrew Flintoff. 
I was, yes. the, I was the 2005 Ashes. Yes. I snuck into... Good commentary in that series. Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> I actually snuck into Old Trafford on day five, if you remember the crowds were... were Snaking up. crowd. Yeah, yeah, I managed to find a little nook and got in, um, and that was when I really fell in love with the game. But I loved his character. I loved the fact that he was able to be himself on the pitch and also influence cricket so much and influence the crowd and I, I love that about him and obviously he's Lancastrian. I've so. seen you celebrate a bit when you take a wicket. You give him a bit of a that, don't you? You're yeah, you have to. A bit of a Freddie, you don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Claire, who was your first real cricketing love? Apart from my dad, I've got to say, um, who was uh, just a good club cricketer, but uh, I learnt so much from, especially how to linseed oil and sandpaper a bat properly. Um, I, my, well, like Kate, my role models, I suppose, in the game were, were men. Um, Alex Stewart, Steve Waugh, Botham. I used to watch, uh, we had the videotape of Botham's Ashes. Um, I literally watched that back and back and back and wore it down. Um, my first female role model in, in the game was Jan Britton, um, who died uh, three years ago, I think now, far too young of cancer, but was inducted into the ICC Hall of Fame yeah, this weekend. Just, yes, that's right. Yeah. Mihaela and uh, Sean Pollock. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but mo mo mostly grew up watching, yeah, watching men's cricket. Rachel? Uh, yeah, Rachel, Rachel less, as I, I never saw her play, um, but as a, a young woman, um, I suppose probably towards the end of my time as England captain, and then as I started working in the game, she became a, a, a real figure and a, a mentor and advisor and, and someone who was obviously always kind of in my corner, and she became the first female, female member on the ECB board. So when I had to go into the board yeah. um, to, to ask for investment or for um, backing or for more resource or uh, whatever, um, it was always great to have Rachel in the room, yeah. Mine was Ted Dexter. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I wondered who yours was, an, an Englishman? It was, no, a South African, actually, was Mike Proctor, because yeah. I, my prep school was in Gloucestershire, and so we'd go and see him playing Sunday, and I remember that extraordinary chest on bowling, and he seemed to heave the ball over the tent every other. We called it Proctorshire in those days. <laughs> Gloucestershire was Proctorshire. You're not going to believe this. When That's you right. said in your lecture that you are... Uh, you talked about Proctor as your hero. There is an email, I promise you this is the truth, this morning, 9.06 a.m., Michael Proctor re Stephen Fry. What a pity I'm going to miss Stephen's address. He's such a hero of mine, and I'm sure, and I'm sure he will be his Norman, normal brilliant best, and I can watch a copy of the lecture. Oh, my God, I never knew you. That's unbelievable. I tell you. There are, there are some things in life that you want your 10-year-old self to know, and you can never, I can never talk to him and say, one day that man that you're staring at as if he's a god will say something nice about you. Oh, my goodness, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. I remember the 1973, I think, cup final when, they, when Gloucestershire first played here. I know they played in 77, but I think they played in 73. And, and I love the sound of the PA announcer. I don't know who it was back then, but I love the way from the pavilion end, yes. Mike Proctor. And it just sounded right, didn't he? And then he sprinted in, didn't yeah. he? That unusual action and bowled everybody out. He got hat-tricks more than anyone yeah. I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. No, and proper, proper. David Shepherd was in the same <coughs> side. Not the, not the bishop, David Shepherd, but the... Uh, the, the umpire. The one leg, yeah, he was Feet fabulous. Up. He looked, Feet up, one he yeah. just, he look, always looked, even when he was a young player or youngish, he looked as if he'd just come out of a butcher's shop and had hung up his apron. It was a wonderful thing. It was he a loved a glass of beer and he took all the young players. I played my first county match was against Gloucestershire. And he came up to me straight after his ear, come with me. Oh, did And he took me to the bar and bought me a pint of beer. Oh. Shep, glorious it was. <laughs> um, damn difficult, this bio-bubble life. Tell us about that. I, I've had minimal experience of it. I've done a few weeks in quarantine here and there. But, but when it drags out over periods of cricket that, that you know, needn't always be exciting and you have long waits between games, it's difficult. Yeah, and I think as uh, the female players, we've actually probably not experienced it as much as the men have. You know, they seem to be flying from bio-bubble to bio-bubble, um, and it's been ongoing for around two years now. Um, our first experience was a lovely Derbyshire. We were there for four weeks in 2020. Um, 
but yeah, it was difficult. I think you learn to appreciate when you go on tours and you get to go out and experience all the cultures of the countries that you're, you're visiting and that suddenly gets stripped away from you. You realise how important those rest days and those hours after training where you get to experience um, things like that, uh, you know, how important they become to you as a, a player. Um, a big thing for me was not being able to see my family. You, the, um, I guess the frightening nature of COVID meant that we couldn't go within two metres of other humans at that time. And I wasn't able to use my support bubble, who are my family members. I was very interested in listening to Stephen talk about mental health. And, and I, I know that you've suffered certainly from anxiety. Would you go so far as to say you've had periods of depression or is that exaggerating? Yeah, I, I actually thought I only suffered with depression and then it was someone else, it was our psychologist at the time who told me that it, a lot of it was performance anxiety. And I said, no, I'm not an anxious person. You know, I'm the clown of the dressing room. I'm always making the jokes. I'm loud. Anxiety is nothing that I've ever experienced. And he, he broke it down for me and told me what I was going through. And I couldn't believe, and I've studied psychology at university as well. I couldn't believe that someone was telling me how I was feeling and why I was feeling how I was. Um, but I think the, the bio bubbles just enhanced that. They made everything feel 10 times worse um, because the natural elements of your life are taken away from you so harshly um, and it was all obviously we wanted to play cricket we were desperate to play cricket at that time and um, so you were willing to do it but it, it does take its toll on you and I think like I said that the guys have had to really endure a lot of that for the benefit of the fan as well for us to be able to watch them play cricket on the TV. It, uh, Stephen touched on it being addressed at last but it truly is isn't it it's not something you're casual about. The mental health side, yeah, yeah ab absolutely. It's um, it's it's of paramount importance, you know, in the same way that it's become a, a, a I suppose, like you know, the race um, uh, situation. As soon as something becomes spoken about and more people speak about it and have the courage to do so, then that makes it you know, it, it, uh, very real and something that we, we have a duty of care to address as people working in the game, administrators and, um, you know, as Kate mentioned, whether they're in the medical profession or whether simply in administration, um, it, it's, it's of paramount importance, you know, in the, you know, we've had physiotherapists looking after athletes for, for, for many years now and looking after their physical well-being and their, their physical injuries. Um, and now that, you know, Stephen listed a number of names and Kate's one of them, players who've had the courage to speak openly about how that feels is so important. And we, you know, the game, the, the game must be completely supportive of, 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 those, of those situations and those players. And, and it makes it, uh, you know, when they see their heroes and role models speaking that way, um, it can provide comfort and a sense of belonging and togetherness for, for, for people who wouldn't have realised that super, you know, super strong cricketers yeah. could feel that way. Last serious question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hear the... <laughs> sorry. sorry. I, the reason I was going straight to Stephen was, was whether you feel now um, that you, you're over the problems that, that you faced or, or are you... Subtly haunted still. No, th th there, is, um, uh, there is a word that doctors use that we sometimes misuse in casual English, which is chronic, which, as I'm sure you know and most people know, it doesn't mean serious. Oh, it's chronic bad, you know. It means it exists through time. So asthma, diabetes are chronic conditions. What you do is you learn to manage and, and cope with them. You carry your inhaler or your, um, you know, your Mars bar if you get hypoglycemic or whatever, if you're diabetic. You know, there are always uh, ways of coping. And, and it's the same with the condition I have, which is called bipolar disorder. It, it's not something that it seems can ever be cured, or at least at the moment no one's talking about curing it, but it, it is something that can be managed and you, you learn how to. And there are two, I think, very important things you have to hold together in your head that seem uh, contradictory. One is that you cannot underestimate how serious it can be. It, you know, we know the names of those who took their own lives in this game, and I'm sure we all know people really not that far from us who have taken their own lives uh, uh, in our families or uh, friendship circles. And, and that's how serious it can be. And it can cause people to slide out of normal work and normal family. They, they reach out to drugs and, and alcohol in order to control moods that otherwise can't be controlled, and they, and they slip down to the very bottom of the pile. Uh, 
and that has to be understood. It is very serious. It can be a, what doctors call a very morbid condition, has high mor morbidity. Um, but at the same time, it's worth remembering that some of the most remarkable people who've ever walked this planet have had this condition. And they've had fulfilled and extraordinary lives and achieved a great deal. One, my personal hero in that field is called Kay Redfield Jameson, uh, an American academic. She's a professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University, which is the leading teaching medical teaching hospital in America, I would say, uh, as well as a visiting professor of uh, literature at St. Andrews. And she has written many books, and yet she has a, such extreme uh, condition in this that she has a maximum amount of lithium, you know, before her liver and kidneys would explode. I mean, she really is very <laughs> seriously ill a lot of the time, but has achieved remarkable things. And just very quickly, the question we all ask, and we all have to know, and I think it's a good answer, is if we transform changing rooms and dressing rooms, I'm sorry, that's the actor in me, dressing rooms, changing rooms, whatever you call them, uh, into places where there is respect and no bullying, um, and if there is banter, it's of the kindest and most understanding sort, does this in some way militate against competitiveness? That's what, there's an unspoken question here. Uh, we used to say, oh, the problem with the, you know, England teams is they can never put the foot on the neck in the way Australians can. We're too soft. Um, and now, is this mental health question asking us to be even softer? And will this make us less competitive? Will it, will it, will it, you know, that is a legitimate question. I think the answer is no. I think it's a very resounding <coughs> no, that there is no contradiction between uh, a supportive team. In fact, I think the England men's team, and I, I can't speak exactly for the women's team, but has had its most success. There have been films made about it as they have bonded in, at a deeper level of friendship and understanding. And the old Ray Illingworth, Brian Close kind of dressing room is no longer acceptable. It creates strength, doesn't it? A different type of strength. Yeah. From the, maybe the macho yeah. male strength that perhaps we've always thought or you, yeah. in, in how we've used that word. I, I think that's the case. It brings, I know from uh, our, our dressing room that it's brought, th those, those conversations have brought players closer together and made them stronger, and therefore that has a positive performance outcome. Would you say? Yeah, completely. And I think from, uh, from the women's dressing room point of view, it also brings an element of vulnerability, which we see as a massive strength in our team when we're open with each other. and. And from my point of view, it also helps me understand my teammates more. So if we are on that seventh week of tour where we're away from our families, stuck in a biosecure bubble, you understand why that person might be behaving the way they are. Um, you know, I, I, people, when they first meet me, tell me that I've got a real sour face, a mardy face. And <laughs> I, often, I think, from being from Lancashire, you get kind of pigeonholed into being that miserable northerner. <laughs> and actually, I'm, I'm allowed bad days. I'm allowed good days. I'm allowed bad days. And now my teammates understand that I'm not miserable. Sometimes I just don't have the best day. In fact, the, you know, the presiding spirit of this evening, the great Colin Cowdery, he was a very good example of someone who was warm and charismatic and friendly and kind, but also played like the devil when he had to. He never lost a competitive edge. I mean, they're wonderful stories. You know, when he was at Slip and a new Australian batsman comes in, says, your first time, isn't it, old thing? And, so, <laughs> I, and the guy I was expecting some kind of terrible thing. He went, yeah. He said, well, good luck, <laughs> but not too much. <laughs> I think it's going to shake Jeff Thompson's hand and say, good morning, I'm Colin Cowdery. Oh, yes, know. that's right. I like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, I'm going to be shot for running over here, but one final um, a, a question to you each, which is a wish. If, if you could close your eyes and wish um, for the next great thing in the women's game in progress, what would it be, Kate? <laughs> I think, the, the, without sounding cliche, the journey that we've had over the last eight years has been remarkable you know where we've come from as a group I've been very lucky to be involved in all of that it's been a whirlwind um, and it's it's almost unimaginable to think where we could be in another eight years because of how fast we've moved um, but I just think the visibility that we have now um, getting more girls playing cricket and boys you know I've seen young boys at games of the hundred wearing female names on the back of their shirts which is just fantastic um, but I'm also going to say uh, we, we need the ashes back. So when we go in January, we'll be trying to pull yeah. that back. <laughs> That's a good wish. <laughs>
Stephen. Well, uh, you, you covered know, a lot of ground yeah. tonight, but just pick, pick one thing. Uh, uh, access for, 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 for the young. The young, wherever they come from, should never feel that cricket is a, an elitist game, a snobby game, uh, a game that isn't for them. It is a game for everyone. The players around the world show that, and the more that message comes out, in fact, the more accents like mine aren't heard <laughs> praising cricket. But, uh, but in all seriousness, it is that. It's just uh, access for the most possible people. And Claire, you've got one year in, in this role. Um, how would you wish it to have ended if you could leave a, a legacy? I know it's a bit of an old cliche, but what would you most wish for in this year? Um, I, would, I would hope that personally it's been uh, an amazingly fulfilling year, which I know already it will be, um, six weeks in. Um, and I, I hope that, you know, Kate talks about the pace of change there. You know, a year will fly by, but it is actually still quite a long time. And I think um, we can do a huge amount in that time. You know, Stephen's spoken about the challenges of this morning, that the, the game is right in the thick of. And all of us are, we have a, all have a role to play in that. So I will certainly take you know, my role in that very seriously over the coming year as president of this club and in my ECB role. Um, and I hope that in a year's time, we're less divided on certain things. Um, there's always, there is good, there is time for challenge and division definitely because that can then bring you together um, more strongly. But I think the game has got to come together. I think we're in a tricky time and I hope I can play a small part in that. Um, and I hope that more boys and girls from all backgrounds feel more included in the game in a year from now. Lovely. The centrepiece. <laughs> the centrepiece of uh, Stephen's uh, talk tonight was change, uh, and, uh, and I hope that, that change is affected to the spirit of the game because people somehow seem to doubt it and think it's it's loose and, and, and difficult to apply, and the spirit of the game is an idea. It's not, a, it's not a code that you have to follow regimentally. It's an idea that you adopt. It's a sense of respect for, for yourself, for, for, for the game itself, and for the people that you play with and against. That's the spirit of cricket. Uh, and tonight we've heard so many angles on the spirit of cricket that we realize how big a subject it is. And all I urge people to do is to embrace it because there's a damn good reason why cricket's been so fabulous for more than 200 years, because it's got its own spirit. So thank you to Kate Cross, who is heroic as a broadcaster and a cricketer. Thank you to our new president for accepting the role and, and lighting up the scene. We wish you a golden year. And thank you, sir, for a performance that we shall never forget.